Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Chan Noriega. I'm the director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. And I want to thank you all for taking part in this conference today. We've called this event Central American Refugees in Detention, Rethinking U.S. Immigration. And we have a threefold goal. Uh, first, to broaden the public understanding of the current crises facing Central American refugees in the U.S. Second, to share effective tactics for achieving social justice for them. And third, to reframe current debates around immigration at large. Now, it's not enough to zero in on the particulars of a problem. We have to see the larger public and policy discourses that orient people and shape their responses. And as you all know, U.S. sentiment about immigration is a contradictory thing, not unlike the Donald Trump piñata outside. <laughs> all brown people are undocumented, and they all come from Mexico. It's as simple as that. Read the Constitution. Um, I was uh, reviewing some of the letters I receive periodically, uh, hate mail, but also thinking about last night's debates. <laughs> now, during the reception, I just want to know, you'll have a chance to connect with Donald Piñata Trump <laughs> and see if you can break through to the sweetness that is inside. So uh, we'll see who gets the first shot uh, at the piñata during our reception. Now, we've organized this conference around, the three, around three sessions that take up these three goals, roughly speaking, plus two keynote addresses. And for the sessions, we're issuing the usual panel format and instead asking a lead speaker to lay out some ideas and issues which our respondents will take up. And for the first and the third session, the panelists are also very interested in a dialogue with the audience. So as you hear them kind of engage with each other, uh, and as we move through the, through the session, uh, be thinking about how you might uh, extend some of the lines of thinking or kind of probe further with some of the questions that have been uh, asked. Now, we hope that this format provides a more dynamic engagement with the issues. For our keynote addresses, our speakers are lawyers. So they'll offer a brief, as it were, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Now, the idea is to get discussion going throughout the day. That is especially important here because we have a wide variety of speakers and participants. Scholars, lawyers, activists, policymakers, administrators, members of the community, and detainees. By talking to each other, we can help strengthen and share the larger vision of social justice for all. Now, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people and organizations in the room that have helped make this event possible and who are working hard to address this issue. First, this event is made possible through the generous support of Tamar Diana Wilson. She is unable to be here today, but she is listening in on our streaming of the event from Mexico. So please uh, give her a round of applause. Now, the idea for this conference started in an extended email exchange between Tamar and myself, and she would send materials and we would kind of comment and go back and forth uh, and until it really as her initiative, the idea of bringing people together for an event like this um, was formed and she offered her support. And she's long been a supporter of efforts to improve the rights and well-being of Central Americans and Mexicans in the United States. And you can read more about Tamar's scholarship and advocacy efforts in the conference program. Now, we're fortunate to have four UCLA partners in this effort. The Center for Policy Research on Aging, <coughs> through its Latinos and Economic Security Project, um, and the Chicano Studies Research Center has been part of that effort for 10 years now. Uh, the Bloom Center on Poverty and Health, Latin American Institute, and the International Institute. And off campus, we're proud to have Homies Unidos participating through their co-founder, Alex Sanchez, and also for the center to be a co-sponsor of their Central American Youth Leadership Conference on Saturday, two days. We have copies of their invaluable resource guide at the registration table, um, or somewhere. <laughs> also, please check out the uh, table outside the room here for Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos and the Spanish speaking. So you can learn more about their very important uh, Children in Crises project. <coughs> so 
law, labor, economic security, public health, aging, gang violence prevention, library services. These are just a few of the approaches being brought to bear on the issue of Central American refugee detention. Putting them into dialogue with each other offers us a broader and more humane vision for moving forward. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and everyone else here whose participation will make this event a success. And finally, I want to give a shout out to the uh, CSRC staff that have worked so hard behind the scenes to make this event happen. Uh, Rebecca Epstein, Rebecca Frazier, uh, Connie, the Rebecca Heskett Garcia, uh, not everybody's name Rebecca here, uh, <laughs> Nathan Okawahira, Darling Sienas, Michael Stone, and Andrea Vargas. And Darling, of course, had the uh, enviable task of going downtown and scouting all of the markets to find the perfect Donald Trump pinata for this event. <laughs> and she promptly texted us. Some of them looked like Clinton, so we had to really zero <laughs> in. <laughs> Uh, now, finally, before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to two of my colleagues who have been really central to this effort. Uh, the first is Lacey Abrego, whose scholarship has given voice to the experiences of transnational families from Central America. And her expertise really helped broaden our understanding of the issues and to make sure that in our efforts, the scholarly efforts were in the service of care and understanding. We not just think about this purely as an intellectual or a purely political uh, enterprise, but real people are involved, and we need to bring that into the discussion and to understand it. And finally, Charlene Villasenor Black, our resident art historian who served as the conference organizer. Um, and all I can say is they say the humanities are not relevant. So, uh, she's done an amazing job, as you, you all know, pulling, um, uh, pulling the panels together and, and making sure everybody was uh, able to be here. And she'll also, even more important for me, uh, be the interim director of the center in the fall while I try to finish a book. So Charlene will be introducing the three sessions uh, throughout the day. And so what I'd like to do now is invite her up and we're gonna get started. Thank you all. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm an art historian, uh, but I was uh, in conversation this morning. Uh, my grandparents were detained uh, in the first detention center in 1923 with seven kids for, for a year. So the topic, I'm an art historian, but the topic of today's conference is very personal, very meaningful uh, to me. I'm delighted to introduce uh, session one on legal advocacy, exploring strategies from scholarly research to expert testimony. Uh, and I'll begin by introducing our moderator, uh, David Hernandez, Assistant Professor of Spanish, Latino, Latino, and Latin American Studies at Mount Holyoke College, formerly of UCLA, and we still really miss you. Uh, his research focuses on immigration enforcement, and in particular, the US detention regime. He is co-editor of Critical Ethnic Studies, a reader, forthcoming 2016 from Duke University Press, and he's finishing a book manuscript entitled Undue Process, Immigrant Detention and Lesser Citizen citizenship. So I'll be turning things over to David. Um, thank you, Charlene, and welcome uh, to everybody here uh, to our first panel on uh, migrant advocacy. Um, before we begin, I want to share with you the structure of this morning's panel and how the dialogue will work. Uh, it's very simple. We will have uh, three presenters, uh, beginning with the lead presentation by Cecilia Menjiva, uh, and followed by two sets of comments by Stephen Manning and also uh, Hiroshi Murumura. So the organizers envision today's activities as a large, complex, and accessible discussion with a wide range of stakeholders, including everyone here in this room, on the pressing issues of Central American migration, asylum seeking, and punishment as a result of seeking uh, lawful humanitarian relief. We will have opportunities throughout the day following the keynote addresses and during breaks and meals for interaction between uh, conference presenters and attendees. And so this morning, after our speakers' presentations and comments, I will direct the initial uh, dialogue to a couple questions, um, and then we will open it up for a larger Q&A from the audience to the entire panel. Um, so let me briefly, oh, I'm also tasked with keeping time, so you might see my signs, but probably not. 
because uh, we've all talked about that. So let me briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, their biographies are in the program, uh, so please refer to this for more details. I'll be very brief. Um, first, we have Cecilia Manjiva. She is the Foundation Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of Kansas. Um, second, we will have Stephen Manning, who is a, an attorney and who is a partner in the Immigration Law Group and Director of the Innovation Law Laboratory in, from Portland, Oregon. And thirdly, we have UCLA's very own uh, Hiroshi Motomura. Professor uh, Motomura is the Susan uh, Westerberg Prager Professor of Law at the UCLA Law School. So please join me in welcoming our panelists as a whole and Dr. Manjiva, who will be our first speaker. So. And thank you so much for inviting me to be on this, um, to be part of this conference, this very important conference. I think it's the only one of its kind. So this is a very special moment for um, Central Americans all over, I think. And, um, and to be part of this panel, because um, this, is, this is my idea of a dream team, um, to work, uh, to be on, this, on the panel with um, legal scholars like Hiroshi, and with Stephen Manning, whose, um, whose advocacy and work I completely admire. So um, this, is, this is really very special for me, and thank you for um, putting me on the panel with them as well. Um, I'm going to respond to two um, general questions that um, Charlene posed to me that were very helpful in getting me to think about my place as an academic, as a sociologist, in the work that um, that that people are doing in um, for Central Americans in detention, so um, first um, the first question is what role can scholars play in supporting legal strategies to aid the Central Americans in detention? So in brief, um, in this my remarks may um, may come. Um, as a surprise to some, but to others they may seem, well, this is what you should be doing anyway, sociology should be doing this. But this is not, uh, it's not always the case in, in the discipline. Um, so in brief, I think we should, be, we should be able to think about our work as enabling us to contribute to change the conditions in which the populations we study live. Kind of simple, right? It's supposed, this is what drove me to, to do the kind of work that I do to draw me to sociology. But it's not always so simple. So let me elaborate on this point by making use of a lens that, that as a sociologist, I have found useful and I'm very familiar with. And that is um, the lens of public sociology. This framework helps me reflect on the rather Huge, huge task of changing the conditions of life for the populations that I care about and that are at the focus of my study. Um, Michael Boravoy, in his presidential address at the American Sociological Association in 2004, laid out what he thought public sociology um, is and should be. Um, so he said that one way of doing, there are many ways of doing public sociology. It's not just one, one way. So for instance, one can do public sociology by writing an op-ed piece based on the research we do. We, write, uh, we reach a broad audience that way. We can even do public sociology through, um, through our teaching. When we teach our students about the structural and historical conditions that shape the way who they are and that have brought them to, to the classroom. Um, but in Michael Boravoy's call to return to a public sociology, he made an impassioned appeal for a return to what he calls an organic public sociology. In his words, this sociology is, um, this is a sociology in which the sociologist works in close connection with the visible, thick, active, local public, such as faith communities, the labor movement, and those who advocate for immigrant rights. So I think I'm very, di very directly following in Borowitz's call. 
in that I had decided to put my research to work for immigrant rights and to work with the volunteer lawyers who are so incredibly dedicated and passionate about the work they do and in my view lead by example. So this is um, how I have found this connection and also I should um, I should emphasize that I have found a niche to be able to find to to make my work relevant to a very specific niche um, and that is the, the the cases of women in detention so that's my my one niche because that's the work that I've done um, but in order to do public sociology well um, Douglas Massey another sociologist argues that one has to have an accurate understanding of the groups and structures one seeks to modify through our work, through action. In order to be effective, one has to first produce research and knowledge that is sound, that meets the, the, what is expected from our disciplines in terms of research that is scientifically sound, he says. In my case, I have produced um, a body of work that that is relevant to the cases on which I have, I have worked. For instance, I wrote this book that, um, that it's, um, it's, the title is Enduring Violence, lives, um, Latina Women's Lives in Guatemala. When I wrote this book, um, I didn't know I was going to, to be able to draw on it to be able to um, help in the cases that I have been able to help. I didn't know um, that my research, I knew that I was studying something important. I, the, the book is about the multiple forms of violence in the lives of, of women in Guatemala, but it, it, it turns out that it has been relevant for Honduras and El Salvador as well. But um, at that time, I thought I could do, I, could, I, I was already thinking about reaching a broader audience beyond academia. So I decided that I was going to donate all the royalties and all the proceeds from the book to the Global Fund for Women. And so all the royalties go to, to the Global Fund for Women because I, I like the way they do in supporting projects that lead to gender justice around the world. So I thought that was going to be my, my, my effort to go beyond academia. Little did I know at that time that I would be using the actual content of the book in, um, in the cases on which I have, I have served, I have served, helped. For instance, I had no idea that I would be explaining in court to judges my understandings, my explanations of violence in the lives of women. That for instance, chapter four in the book, which deals with marital relations, was going to be introduced as evidence sometimes that chapter five, which deals with um, labor force participation in, the, in how sometimes the work of the women do is depreciated, um, was going to be helpful in making a point about that in another dec declaration. So um, this work, I think, has helped me see my work in a very different light. Um, so I don't, I think the, the benefits on, on one way have been, um, have been both ways. I have been able to put my work to help cases, but also the very work that I've been doing has helped me in multiple ways. The public sociology that I seek to follow is also reflexive, meaning that it addresses issues of value and general purpose. It is a sociology bound to civil society to the huge array of associations and movements that stand be between apart from the economy and the state. And as such, Borovoy argues, it is a sociology that represents the interests of humanity. This is a, a tall call, but I, this is how I like to see my work. And, um, and it is a sociology or a position that entails rethinking our relationship to the university, to our colleagues, to our discipline, and how it train our students as well. Um, so it really involves a rethinking of our place in relation to the work we do and the research we produce. So I would like to, um, to also emphasize the, 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 what serving on these cases, providing testimony for these cases has done for me as well. 
um, <clears throat> how this work has impacted me, how I see my work and how I see my role as a researcher, at, as an academic, and um, as a result of participating in these testimonies that I have been able to provide. Um, I have acquired a responsibility, a sense of duty, after collecting, um, after writing this book and having this knowledge and knowing that there are women in detention who might benefit from me sharing this knowledge, I can't just sit and not, and not accept to, to work on one more case, for instance. And um, so this, the work itself has been quite transformative for me. It has, um, it has allowed me to develop a sense of responsibility of going beyond um, my normal responsibilities in academia that I probably would not have had had I not been working on these cases and working with the amazing lawyers that I've been working with. Um, so it, I think I've become, I, I, through the work that I have done in immigrant communities in the United States, I have learned about the power of the law, for instance. I have learned how powerful the law is in everyday life. But working in, on these cases and providing testimony in court, for instance, um, has allowed me to, to see another side of the power of the law. Um, one time I was um, testifying telephonically for a case that Stephen Manning um, was, was doing. And, um, there was no one in my house. There was, I was by myself. Um, I, no one saw me, there were no cameras. There, were, there wasn't a video, um, video conference testimony, it was just telephonic conference um, testimony. And when the judge asked me to raise my right hand, um, I did it. And no one was watching me, but I did it. And I am aware, I mean, I have writing, I've been writing, I've been reading about the power of the law. But just that moment that the judge asked me to raise my right hand, and, and I did, and, and after I did that, he, um, she, she or he said, now you can, you can put your, lower your hand or something, and I did. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, can you imagine? I know the, I mean, I study, I, I read legal scholars' work. So, the, um, so that, those, those moments give me another sense of what I study. The, because this is also um, what I study in my in my um, in my other research, and so um, I'm sure we'll, we'll have um, more time later to to share other 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 experiences that I've had. Um, uh, the second question, and very briefly, because I'm probably close to time, three minutes. Okay, I'll do it in three minutes. What is required of a powerful testimony was the second question. And I think this would be, um, this probably is a question um, that, that the lawyers on the panel can um, better address. But one thing uh, that I, I try to do in my testimony that also allows me to really draw on my work quite a bit is to not portray the culture the immigrants come from as inherently violent or the men as simply machistas or culturally inclined to be violent. I have tried my best to situate the everyday violence in the lives of the women in Central America within broader structures and institutions, drawing from, from um, concepts of structural violence and symbolic violence so that I don't focus on the individuals. I focus on the structures and the institutions because that also allows me to um, to make an argument for why governments are unwilling or unable to respond to women who seek, uh, who are in need of help. So, um, so that's my just my very brief um, um, summary of how I I do some of the of the testimony that I do. And I think I'm going to end here because I don't have time. Well, thank you. <laughs>
So my name's Steven, and I was telling Denise and a couple others, I tend to cry a lot now, so if I start crying, it just happens, so just bear with me. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in the Dili Detention Center before that in Artesia, and what I want to do is I want to answer, uh, so respond a little bit um, to Cecilia, like what are the role scholars can play, right? What are the role scholars can play? And scholars can play, they have such a critical role, right? And the role is to, what's happening on the ground um, in Dili and in Carnes is like, right now there's two detention centers that combined equate to, to about 50% of the entire detention capacity for the United States for immigrants. Um, they're bigger than even the California sun. Um, and they're immensely powerful. So right now there's about 2,100 children and women detained in Dilly, Texas. And Carnes has a capacity that's building up to 1,000. Right? Um, and they're adding more beds. Um, right now we have um, uh, breastfeeding infants in detention. Um, being subjected to um, a policy that is really based on that's not based on a, not, that's not based on reality. What we have on the ground is that DHS has these endless resources. They have more money than they know what to do with, and so they've decided that they're going to um, aim it right at Central American refugees, and particularly at women with children. Um, they have it's three hundred thirteen dollars a head per day, right? That's what the government pays for every kid and mother that gets detained. Um, and so for the Corrections Corporation of America, that amounts to a billion dollars over four years. That's their contract. For a GEO, which operates the Carn City Detention Center, um, they get paid both when they're detained and when they're, they're released because the, that's CAR or GEO hold, owns Behavioral uh, Institute or Behavioral Interventions, which runs the ankle shackle program when individuals are released. So people get, so, they, so these corporations make immense money, right? So that's a reality on the ground. Um, the reality on the ground is that the federal government, um, and I'm a b firm believer in good government, so I'm like not, this is not an anti-government rant. Um, it's mostly just this, trying to describe what's happening um, along the, the border. That the federal government has immense power immense power. They have this constellation of statutes, right, from the Immigration and Nationality Act that governs immigration here in the United States, Section 235B, Section 236A, and Section 241A of the Immigration and Nationality Act. There's this concentrated dose of plenary power that just packs this incredible punch, right, a lot of peace there, quick, that gives them, like, essentially sort of an unchecked ability and unchecked ability to do what they want, at least that's what they think, right? It allows them to engage in this detention of children. It allows them to engage in the detention, mass incarceration of women. And I would note that women and men, um, especially women with children, are treated very differently. Right? So you find women with children subjected to these uh, harsh no release or impossible release detention policies that men are not subjected to, right? so that the policy actually is aimed at um, mothers right? with kids. Uh, you see that there's this immense amount of power that's directed uh, at the border uh, to engage in politicized detention, right? because when you, it becomes politicized when you wrap this power around this population with an invasion narrative. Right? So these are people who are coming to invade our country. And when people are coming to invade our country, what do we have to do? We have to deport them, right? Because that's the only possible response. So that's what I call deportationism. And so what role do scholars have to play? So scholars play the role of bringing the reality on the ground in back into alignment with the reality in the world, right? That these are not, this is not an invasion, right? That this, uh, that this is actually, these are actually bona fide asylum seekers, right? So we have a year's worth of data showing that about 92%, right? It's actually approaching 95% of these women and children are passing credible fear interviews so that by law, they have a substantial chance of winning asylum, right? We have a substantial body of data showing that they actually do win asylum, right? And yet we still are continuing to detain them. And so scholars like Cecilia, excuse me, shouting, scholars like Cecilia, they can bring the facts and the data that we need
to show what the reality ought to be, right? And we can win this, right? And I say win, right? Because I'm a lawyer, so I do. I'm really interested in winning, right? We can win when we can align the reality on the ground with the reality in the world, right? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to just uh, really quickly talk about the role scholars and lawyers when we, when we play together. This is what happens, okay? So just a little context. So like, like a year ago, right? A year ago and a little bit. So the federal government, this is when they noticed that somehow that the sort of what I would consider civil, sort of the civil disintegrate, the civil things were breaking down in Central America, right? And the normal uh, rule of law that would constrain interfamily violence or that would constrain uh, gang violence was beginning to evaporate. It didn't have the power that it needed, right? And so as a result, a lot of uh, violence spiked, right? Murder spiked, right? Interfamily violence spiked, right? And there wasn't any way to restrain it. And so people, women, children, make very rational decisions like, I'm out of here, right? And they became coming to the United States seeking asylum. And at first, if you recall back in June, think back to June 2014, right? We had a humanitarian crisis at the border. We need to solve this, right? Three weeks later, it became an invasion narrative. We're being invaded. We've got to stop this. And when, as soon as that narrative changed, the government deployed different resources, right? And they built a detention center in the middle of the desert, and they built a detention center in Artesia, New Mexico, where there were this many lawyers. That's right, each one of those represents a lawyer, and they were all men, right? And one of them, so there's two government lawyers, and one of those government lawyers was the actual, the chief uh, government lawyer, the prosecutor for, the, for uh, immigration. So they built a center in the middle of nowhere, and with this immense power, built into an invasion narrative. And so what in the world could we do? And so this is something, uh, this is really interesting. So the government has this immense power, and this immense power they were trying to aim for, these massive incidents of deportation right, that were gonna occur at a high velocity, right? So bang, these waves of deportation, because that's our response to an invasion narrative, right? And so, this, so the white dots represent human beings, right? Those are women and children who were deported, right? And so the very first beginning is that when uh, the uh, Artesia was open, right? And then down here at the side is when Artesia was closed. And if you look at the very beginning, so lawyers, we kind of showed up. We had no idea what we were doing. We're just kind of going there, trying to figure out what's going on, what can we do? And like, bang, right? First wave of deportation takes place. And the government wanted these waves to happen. Bang, bang, bang. And you see, that's exactly what's happening at the beginning. Bang, the next big wave, right? At the beginning, the lawyers were working on a one-to-one -one principle, right? So, like, if I'm a lawyer and I'm representing my client, I have just as much power as my client has because I just am channeling that power. And as I just explained, there's people have very little power at the border, right? Because if there's three statutes and this doctrine called plenary power and this invasion narrative, right? So, our clients had very little power. And if we were to continue to kind of operate on that one-to-one -one principle, what we're gonna find is that the government was gonna win. They were gonna win with that immense power. And so we began thinking, okay, we need to do something different here. And we need to begin trying to find, can we find power that's not just within the Fifth Amendment due process clause? Can the lawyers create power for themselves to help end the removals, to help like slow the deportations? And so at the beginning, we were operating on one-to-one, -one, and you see the next bang, the next wave, right? And then we begin operating collectively. We begin reaching out to Cecilia. We begin reaching out to Nestor. We begin to reaching out to lots of different scholars, collecting information. Denise, working with Denise and the folks in Cornell, working together collectively, right? To begin creating not just one-to-one, -one, but the lawyers themselves were gaining power outside of the Fifth Amendment. And we would do that by creating procedural but process, right? Because that's what lawyers love, process. So we'd create process. We would build ourselves into the detention center, right? We would actually create an office in there. And when we do that, look what happens, right? So within just three weeks, we have a space between the next wave. So it wasn't happening week after week after week, right? And then look what happens. The next wave is three weeks away, and it's smaller, right? And then look what happens. The waves pretty much vanish until right around here at the end when the lawyers go away, right? Because it's Thanksgiving, right? lawyers go away, and look what happens, the deportations bloom again, right? And so lawyers working together with scholars, right? lawyers working together with scholars, where we're able to reverse that, that power dynamic, right? And build power to suppress the removals, right? Over the course of six months that Artesia was in existence, essentially, right? 
um, there were 1,200 women and children that were detained in that center. And with 14 lawyers on average, so this is week by week, 14 lawyers on average on the ground, right? We were able to represent all those people. Right? So 14 lawyers, and so that would represent all the different, the different times each week. And so what we'd do is like lawyers would come down, they would work for a week, work on a case, so lawyers became these fungible commodities. We like to think we're so important, so special, and so great, but we're actually pretty fungible, right? And the important person in the relationship is the client, right? And the scholars, right? The client and the scholars. And the lawyers, we just can, we can do our work anywhere, really, and we don't need to, I don't need to do the work. And so at the end of my week on the ground, I would rotate out and another lawyer would take my place, pick up where I left off and carry it forward, right? And as a result, we were able to do that. Now, those are the principles that I would like to take, that I take away from what we learned in Artesia and what we're learning in Dili with the CARA project, um, is that we have to nationalize this. We have to nationalize the issue, right? So it's just not border lawyers solving the border problem, but it's every lawyer's responsibility to solve this problem, right? And we verticalize it. And what I mean by verticalize it, it means we collect the data, we have, we're actually providing, it's kind of like the Apple ecosystem, right? You build the software and the machine, right? So we're actually gonna provide all of that. So we're actually gonna do the work in the center, collect the information and data, feed that to the litigators, right? We're gonna hear from one of our litigators later on today, right, Peter? Feed that to the litigators so they can create more power for us to continue to provide service. And so we verticalize and nationalize. Make David, David's job easier. I'm going to start a stopwatch here. But um, also reminds me once I gave a talk and I set the stopwatch for 10, 10 minutes, but I thought it was for 10 minutes. I actually set it for 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then I. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I had some um, things prepared to say. I'm going to sort of say them, but I really want to frame them in a way that responds to what Cecilia and Stephen have, have said because I think this whole question of of sort of how um, how advocacy and scholarship work together is really really an important one, and it's an important one especially uh, in an academic setting like this uh, on campus, but also with a lot of people in the community um, here. And the the basic idea here is that um, I want to give some examples of how I think ideas matter in this particular context and how law matters. Um, some of it has to do with some of the issues that, that, that uh, Stephen raised with regard to access to counsel, for example. Um, and um, and uh, Cecilia and Stephen raised issues of asylum claims and how that how it gets played out. And so I'm not gonna go too much more into that because but I just do wanna identify those as places where legal scholars uh, and uh, social scientists are very involved in bringing up legal claims. But I wanna, I wanna look at this a little bit more um, a little bit more from a perspective that transitions a bit to the second panel, which uh, is really a bird's eye view of these events. Because I think that legal scholars have not only a role to play in the uh, elaboration and reframing of legal claims and supporting legal claims in particular cases, uh, but also in really reshaping the way the debate is framed. And so I just want to give some examples of that in this particular um, situation because these are, these are ways of framing that I think pose both um, conceptual interventions and empirical interventions. And I just want to name three. Um, the first one is to really think about the political context for all of this. Um, and uh, this, you know, you could write a whole book just on the political context of the current situation, but let me just pick up some, some main points here. Um, someone asked me some time ago, it's kind of a sort of a quizzical and very good question, actually. Uh, what was when was the golden age of immigration? You know, and I and, and I realized that the golden the golden age of immigration in American political history is always a generation ago, or two generations ago. People think wistfully about the time their grandparents came, or you know, and so why don't people stand in line like my grandparents did? And and so there's always this notion of immigration political context uh, really for the, ever since the, the founding of this nation and before has been about trying to separate good immigrants from bad immigrants. And that's a really key thing that you see here um, in a lot of different contexts. One of them is in the, the, the intervention of criminal law into immigration law. The whole notion of criminalizing 
uh, border crossers, that's really ratcheted up the political discourse in this country. And of course, you see this in Europe today with Hungary doing that to people trying to come in from Serbia. Um, this is all, and, 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 and this is all about the wall and the fence, and so the criminalization of good and bad immigrants. You see this also in the advocacy for the DREAM Act as compared to broad scale legalization, where um, now all of a sudden, well, it's the innocent kids against the guilty parents. That's also kind of a good immigrants, bad immigrants move. And I think you've really seen this. This picks up a bit on what Stephen was saying. Um, you really see this in the response to uh, Central American migrants in the last, especially in the last uh, 18 months, but really um, earlier, much, much earlier than that. And, and, and so you have this contest between seeing this as a refugee crisis uh, versus an immigration invasion. Right? So, that's very much what's gone on here, and the political context, context most immediately is not just that, but also how the Obama administration has really dealt with this current situation. Um, I think that the Obama administration's basic uh, political response to, to immigration in general has been to try to separate out good immigrants from bad immigrants, or, from the, or immigration problems from immigration solutions in a, very, in a way that's very artificial, but has political currency, and that is to say, um, we're going to, on the interior, we're going to, uh, we're going to have DACA. We're going to go to, we're going to uh, expand DACA in, in November 2014. We're going to introduce uh, deferred action for parents in, in the form of DAPA. Um, but, to, but on the one hand, that's been the response in terms of, of what it perceives sort of as the interior, and then be really tough, hard line on enforcement, especially on the border. It's almost as if, it is as if, and people have said this explicitly, we're going to gain political points by being tough on enforcement of the border, and then we'll gain political support for legalization. Of course, it's, it hasn't worked uh, out that way by any means, but it's, it's really a situation where that was the political context in which the government responded to, the, to what was going on on the border last year. And think about this in the context of the Obama administration holding up its announcement of what became expanded DACA and what became DAPA in November of 2014, holding it up until after the midterm elections, um, and then being put in this quandary of trying to figure out exactly how to conceptualize and politically um, either capitalize or do damage control from its perspective on what was happening with Central American migrants. And so all of a sudden what you had is the kind of response that Stephen described, but really being kind of a play out of this good immigrants, um, better immigrants, idea in the context of that election, and it's, it's, it's um, you know, if the th this is something that we don't think about um, quite as much today, but this was also the time when the Ebola virus scare was very dominant in the politics of the midterm elections. And uh, that seems like a long time ago, but it was as, it was as uh, prominent, uh, particularly um, in Republican primaries, but then in, in the midterm elections. Uh, as what was going on on the southern border. Um, so, so that's that's part of the political context, and I just raised this partly because um, I think the role that that um, uh, that, that uh, both legal scholars and social scientists can play in this is very much in this space of trying to change that sort of narrative. An example of this for, uh, is that uh, is that so many of the people who are coming north have undocumented uh, family members in this country. Uh, and so when you think about that, that really uh, debunks this notion of you've got the people kind of coming in from the outside and people who are already here. If legalization and comprehensive immigration reform had become law uh, after the Senate passed it, then a lot of this would have gone away in the sense that you would have family unity provisions that would allow people who would legalize to bring families here. So in that sense, that's just an example of work that's both conceptual, but it's also empirical. Um, so uh, just a, uh, another thing that I wanted to mention, which is uh, something we're thinking about both conceptually and empirically, is to look at what's going on in this situation, but also what's going on in Europe. And uh, to think about what I would generally label the, the regional and the global context for refugee movements. Think about that, and, and that has both conceptual and empirical elements. I think one of the things that's been going on here, and maybe it's really always been going on, is that countries that see themselves as um, trying to make this good immigrant, bad immigrant sort of invasion or welcoming kind of dichotomy, um, countries are, are always, in a sense, trying to outsource border control. Um, we've seen this a bunch of times, um, and, what's in, and one of the interesting things that's happened over the last 12 months is the, is the, uh, the use by the current administration uh, 
of relations with Mexico to get Mexico to act as kind of the outer buffer for what's going on um, with people coming north from Central America. And this is a long history. Um, and I just want to urge people to think about it in this context. This is more a historical sort of comment, but I think it's also a conceptual intervention. Um, when people left Haiti in large numbers over the last whole last generation, what happened? What happened was the U.S. Coast Guard got involved and kept people from landing so that they could make asylum claims. That was really, it wasn't outsourcing border control, but it was moving the border out to a place where refugee protections under international law would not apply, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, turns out, if you really think back, um, this has been going on, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, in the storied past of European immigration, um, you had people coming to Ellis Island and that's where border control took place. But actually what happened was the border control was outsourced to, Europe, to U.S. consulates. Again, it was a U.S. agency, but it was outsourced to Europe where people had to get visas before they could get on a boat. So the whole idea has been to try to get people out, away from the border. Um, and, and this is what's going on in Europe right now. Um, you know, Europe has this arrangement called the Dublin uh, Agreement, and that basically says that you have to apply for asylum in the first safe, in the first country you land in. And so, for example, if you get to Germany, um, the normal rule is that you're not allowed to bring an asylum claim because you went through Italy and you should have applied there. So, here's the here's the tension and the conceptual thing I want to bring up is that um, a lot of the global and the regional context for refugee movements is complicated by this really central tension. On the one hand, on the bad side of things, you've got um, countries like the United States really trying to, rid, as they would think about it, as the government would think about it, rid itself of obligations or make sure that obligations um, aren't called in uh, by, by under international law for the, for the uh, I think, the, the majority of, of people coming in who should have valid asylum claims. Uh, so there's this real danger of allowing this kind of um, outsourcing of border control to take place. But the tension is that a lot of the solutions are regional. Uh, this, the tension is that a lot of solutions are in trying to think about this in terms of regional economic policy, in terms of our relationship with Mexico and Central America. Uh, and that's really where, um, that's really where, um, I, mean, I hesitate to use the word solutions, but that's really where sort of, the, the, that's the only way to think about this in a way that it's going to work, but if that's going to require this country to really rethink its entire relationship historically and currently with Latin America. And that is, that's something that is politically um, been really hard um, to do. So I just want to identify that um, as a basic tension. So these are just two examples of things where um, I think ideas do matter, um, and I do think they matter on the ground, and I think it's important for scholars to both think about this conceptually. I think that we can change the terms of debate, but I also think that we can frame issues in a way that lend themselves uh, not just to conceptual but to empirical work to fill out questions like, what is actually the connection between people coming to the United States and people who are already here and have been part of the part of communities here? Um, what exactly is going on when? Um, countries outsource border control, and what exactly is the, how can we work to have regional arrangements that are actually not um, uh, invidious and discriminatory, but ones that actually work towards uh, solving what are essentially our, our regional problems. And in a way, I mean, it's a feel funny closing on this note as a, as a lawyer, but it makes me also realize that the law can frame things, but in a, in a way, these are not just legal problems, right? These are not legal problems. These are problems of, of uh, global policy, of economics. Um, and um, this is something that, uh, that as a lawyer, uh, even though I'm, I'm working to think that, I, that legal ideas matter, I'm also, it's also um, sobering and humbling to realize that in a way, um, the law can only go so far. These are not just legal problems. And this is the reason why it's important for legal, uh, legal advocates and legal scholars to work very closely with social scientists because um, we're all in this together. Thanks. Um, well, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is a great way to get the, uh, uh, the, mo the morning started and, and, to, and to propel our day. I wanted to ask a couple questions uh, before we open it up to the audience. And, and I wanted to follow up on, on Cecilia's initial conversation and what everyone talked about is the merger of, of the working together of scholars, but also um, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, community members, but everyone who falls under the, this larger category of advocacy. 
And I thought Cecilia uh, gave uh, a great uh, example of the sort of the actual ways that practical conditions can change for people by this by this direct work. But um, I'm also interested in how I wanted to ask Cecilia about what she thought about uh, scholars, and this is very important for students too. Um, how also by being involved can actually change the discourse and the way we talk about migrants, the way we talk about immigration. Uh, and this could be around uh, uh, her own work on, on the discussion, the, the definitions of violence, on uh, the notions of quote unquote illegality, or even the definition of family. I mean, a lot of this family detention stuff is focused on women and children, you know, and there's lots of forms of family <coughs> out there as well that, that are involved. So, uh, so if you could return to the original questions, Sila, but, but about discourse as well, as well as the practical conditions. Yeah, you can. Um, how we change the conversation, how yeah, we change the language, the conversation. The language. I, I think um, it is, if we're going to change the language and the conversation in our research circles, we, we have to um, do it in that context, um, to do it through our writings, through, so that people become aware that this is, the, the taken for granted definitions may not always apply, that there are, that new immigrants, new immigrant populations are probably reshaping um, the way we think about immigrants and refugees, the way we are thinking about violence. Violence is not always physical force. Um, so it, I think as academics, we, we have to start in our home territory, so to speak, and write um, in our research about that. And then we can take it um, outside of academia. But as that is our primary home, that's where we need to start so that the conversation within academia can also change. Thank you, thank you. Uh, second, I had, I had a question for uh, Stephen, kind of a, a, a framing question along the lines that, that Hiroshi had spoken. And um, uh, the, the Secretary of, of the Department of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, still refers to the, the Central American asylum seeking as a, quote, illegal immigration. And um, if we were to highlight uh, migrants' actual existing legal rights, including seeking asylum, especially seeking asylum, how would this change the tone and even the practical responses to Central American migration? It would be awesome. <laughs> um, because here's the thing. Like when we think like it's an invasion, our only response is like, dude, we need to deport, right? But if we think, okay, these are women, because so the law, here's an interesting thing. To file for asylum, you have to be physically present in the United States. You can't be anywhere else, right? You can't, there's like, you can't just show up at an American consulate abroad and file for asylum. It doesn't work that way, right? It, you have to be here, right? And the US has no refugee processing, right? So we do refugee numbers, we do no refugee processing in Central America. We have this little thing where you get like, there's 1,500, like, for the kids, I don't know, but we've done it a couple times and they just get denied. So you have to come here, right? And so we have, there's international law, right, that says, hey, you can seek asylum, right? There's a right to that. And you have a right, if you're on the U.S., to come to the U.S. and actually file for asylum when you're in the U.S. So these women, they're in compliance with the law. They're showing up and they are turning themselves in. They're showing up and they may be being apprehended and they're filing for asylum. That is complying with the law. If we were to think, oh, instead of just deport, right? Let's say, hey, what can we do to make sure everyone stays in compliance? Because that's how we're going to enforce our law. We're going to kind of help these women, help these children, help all the asylum seekers, right? Help all the people, all the immigrants, really, to comply. And we can do that by not necessarily detaining them, right? We don't have to detain to get compliance, right? We can say, okay, look, here's your rights. You have a right to file for asylum, right? Here's what you need to do. And if we have, if we take this compliance narrative and move it away from the deportation narrative, right? A whole range of possibilities open up. And we are blind to those right now because President Obama has declared them to be unlawful migrants and Jay Johnson is following in that line. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and one question for Hiroshi. Uh, uh, you know, I was watching the, the debates on the plane last night um, uh, for some laughs, of course. And, um, but I was struck by how actually a lot of the Republican candidates talked about the difference between visa overstays and persons um, crossing the board, entering, entering without inspection. You know, that usually the, the presumption is everyone came here 
uh, without inspection, swam across, came across them. So I was shocked by that. I was, I was, so I wanted to ask Hiroshi, um, what do you think the effect, and that's relatively new, I think, in, in the super general public discourse. What is the effect of decades of border enforcement as the sort of central framing device uh, for all things immigration related? And, and um, what are the limits of this frame uh, and how this treats all migrants as if they just ar arrived? Well, I hope this is responsive to, to what you're saying and, and follow up if it's, if it, if it's not. Um, I think that the politics of immigration really um, creates a space for people, I guess like Donald Trump, to try to find the simplest solution possible that fits the neatest sound bite. And so we've really seen this in its most extreme version where if border control is too subtle, Let's take citizenship away from people. That would be more clear. <coughs> and so I think that um, the idea of having a bigger wall or a taller fence um, fits into this idea that if you can um, come up with a simple solution that basically scores political points in a rather short election cycle, that that's the space that someone's going to occupy uh, in the politics. So uh, I just mentioned Donald Trump as someone who's really, um, really raised the question of citizenship, and he's not the first one to do this. I mean, in a sense, it's been part of American history to deny citizenship to African Americans. Um, and that's really um, so central, I think, um, in American history. And so, you know, you can't, you can't talk about someone's rights. It's better just to decide they're not here, or they're not, they're not people, um, in the sense of, recognized by the, by the state. Um, so then your question about what are uh, visa overstays. I think that once you get to this question of visa overstays, uh, then you know you start getting into, I think, the reality of this, which is the, the historical line between the legal and the illegal in, in this country um, and in American history, and especially in the last 50 or 60 years, is very blurred. Um, you know, I, 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 um, you know, I often, so, so I, I have this book about undocumented immigration, and I actually thought about um, the first chapter of it is, is called Undocumented or Legal Question Mark. It's, it's meant to be complicated. I, I really sort of, I often thought I should have titled that chapter The Parts of the Legal I Really Don't Understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it's, it's a kind of a long answer, but I'm just saying that this is, it's important to think about the politics in which the the, the target is citizenship versus border control versus something more, more relatively subtle, like visa or state. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, we have a little more time, so we would like to open it up to some questions from the audience. And please direct it to whoever you want to. Sure, all right. Um, this, my name is Michael Rodriguez, and I'm from the School of Medicine at UCLA. And I want to uh, applaud the audience uh, and the, the panelists for excellent presentations. Um, and one of the things that I want to underscore and, and that I appreciate is the, the point that you make about the importance for collaboration across disciplines. And for me, that helps, that underscores that this is a complex issue. And because it's a complex issue, it really requires a comprehensive approach. And your focus on addressing different ways of responding that may be helpful, I think is extremely also appreciated. Uh, I'm from the health perspective, and so I, I wanted to sort of just uh, get your thoughts on some of the health narrative around this. One of the aspects that has been happening, and it was interesting that the topic of Ebola came up, because at times the, the, the topic of Ebola was used as a form of, of scaremongering. So historically, uh, sort of politicians and other people, spokespeople, have used uh, health and health problems and fear about potential health problems as a form of scaring the public. And as they did most recently, mentioning how the potential that these immigrants coming across uh, these un unaccompanied minors could be carrying Ebola as well as any host of other types of infectious, contagious conditions. And now these are false without any kind of support at all. 
And uh, we've been working, I've been working with other sort of types of health national organizations to sort of see if there's a role for health to be a partner also, so that these types of claims are actually addressed in a very formal way or responded to effectively to, be he to help to prevent them from happening um, in the future. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about uh, sort of another, this other partner, some of these other sort of ways in which folks use uh, the claims to scare uh, the public uh, and, and also to change public opinion in order to sort of have it be more of an enforcement as opposed to inclusionary. So, thank you. Well, and I think, Michael, that, that's really important. And when I use the phrase social scientist, probably I probably met, you know, everybody. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, um, but, you know, I mean, we're all social scientists, right? I mean, we're all doing, I mean, that kind of critical work is super important, especially in response because this health thing has always been part of this, right? I mean, this has been, when you look back at the first immigration laws, they really focused on, um, on, uh, on health or perceived health issues. In fact, you know, the, the, the exclusion for, uh, for, for, based on sexual orientation that was actually part of the United States law until 1990 was really phrased in health terms. It was, not, you know, it wasn't, didn't use words like homosexuality. It actually used the word psychopathic personality, and then it was really something where the public health service was the agency that was assigned to enforce that. But let me just raise another thing, which is more about. It could be a question or to, to you or, back, or anyone else, but it, yeah, there's an interesting kind of a risk here, and this goes back to this good immigrant, bad immigrant thing, um, in, in, in some way. It's, it's a, the risk is what kind of arguments we make. I think back to the argumentation against Proposition 187 in California, which was a strong anti-immigrant initiative in California that passed, uh, was later mostly struck down by the courts, but um, it was California in 1994, and much of the argument from the immigrants' rights community against Proposition 187 in, in 20 years ago was, was like, we need, to, um, we need to give public health to uh, the undocumented, or we need to educate the undocumented because otherwise they will blank. And it, 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 it's always, it's a way of really marginalizing uh, immigrants and saying the reason that we need to provide health education is uh, because, not because, because it's, 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 it's uh, something that people have, have, have earned by contributing to this community uh, or as a human right, but because somehow it's gonna hurt us and so that's a real danger to make the argument that we need to recognize that there's some public health issue that if we broaden broad the health care that um, the people already here are the, are, the, are the principal beneficiaries. There's a certain danger in that argument. It's not that different from distinguishing between um, innocent children and guilty parents in this, in this, in this bad way. There's a, can I? Yeah, please. Real quick, so um, it's a, I, I agree that it's the otherization, right? It's like, this is how do you make someone different than you? So like, the mayor of Artesia, he, like, I quote, I don't want those people bringing their diseases into my community, end quote. And that each time we want a release of an individual, right? That he was like, they can't stay here because I don't want those diseases. And there was, I don't think we're reporting in the paper as well, like, what the, like was there a new incidence of chicken pox or whatever? Thank you for your informative panel. Um, we just went through another 9-11 celebration for the country. And some of us remember talking about how what was going to follow 9-11 was not going to be exclusively nor primarily about Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians, but that there was a larger raison d'etat, reasons of state at work, right? Some of us were very clear on that especially those that were students of surveillance. If you look at the legal regime that was constructed following 9-11, it's pretty clear that it was not primarily nor exclusively about Arabs, South Asians, etc. Using the same kind of logic, legally, and for anybody on the panel really, um, is there a possibility that what the legal foundation they're laying with Central American families and children may have something to do not just primarily nor exclusively about Central America, but it maybe has something to do with what some of us are seeing around climate change. There are about a billion people that are expected to be um, 
uprooted and having to migrate from their homelands between now and around 2050, more or less. And so the Pentagon, if you look at the Pentagon and other US agencies, they've been doing their homework, visiting. I've been with them in international migration conferences. And they're there, they're whispering in the ears of European states that are doing what they're doing, they're Syrians, etc. And they're with the Latin American states telling them what to do, what they'd like them to do, because, so I wonder, is there a possibility that they're really using the Central American kids and the families to lay a, a foundation for something much bigger than 60,000, 70,000 women and children? <laughs> okay. Um, very, very quickly, so that we can take all the questions. Um, I, you know, I had not thought about it in that way. Um, my thinking is, when I think broadly, I think about um, the role the United States play in creating conditions of violence in Central America, historically. And so, in my mind, I'm thinking of Central Americans migrating to the United States to escape the conditions of extreme violence that are the legacy of what the United States has done there. And so on the one hand, um, these bigger structures that are shaping their lives are m very much connected, of course. And so I, when I think broadly, I think along those lines. But I, I, I honestly have not made a connection with um, climate change or, or other, other, <laughs> other, other forms of broad thinking about this? Well, you know, 9-11 um, resulted in some change in the statutes, like the Patriot Act. But most of the changes that took place and affected people's lives really badly in after 9-11 had to do with the exercise of discretion by government, by government officials who would use laws that are always on the books and just decide who to target. We have a system, a legal system that really runs on the, on the discretion of enforcement officers, sometimes very just field officers, as long as you have a system like that. Um, and it's really kind of, I think it's a lawless system actually, um, where, where some people are targeted, some people are not. I think, you're, I think that's a system that we have, uh, that's, that's, that's what's wrong with it, and I think that it's, it's part of a system like that to have a detention in it perhaps. Um, and so that's the connection I see with 9-11. It's like, it's the targeting of people successively depending on who's uh, controlling things politically and what the rhetoric of the time is, and it could be Ebola, it could be 9-11, it could be such a lot. If there, if the government right now in our public and allowing the government, you know, speaking for us, to normalize the extended detention of children and mothers who have a substantial claim for winning us out in a very sympathetic population, if they can normalize that, they can do anything they want. Right? Like that becomes the new power dynamic. So sure, climate change, whatever, we can detain anybody. I, I would just add that in my own work that um, that when you have the, you know when you build an infrastructure and especially for the family detention infrastructure are the newest and largest detention facilities in the country. Um, but a lot of the old ones were former prisons, and before that they were a different kind of prison. Before that they were another kind of a prison. And so once you build one of these structures, unless you turn over the dirt and flip it over and destroy it, it will become another prison. And so I think there is there there is absolutely something to that. But I wanted to say. Um, uh, you know, we're almost out of time, and I wanted to, uh, and we have a special announcement. Uh, so I wanted to uh, take a moment to thank our presenters, both for uh, mapping this very rugged landscape of uh, Central American detentions today, but also for their individual labor that they do every day, advocating, defending, and teaching all of us. Um, so uh, that's it for this first time. We have lots of time to discuss all day, so, uh, and we have a special announcement, so thank you very much. give a few shout outs. Uh, I don't know if everybody was here when the program began, but this vital discussion is being made possible by a number of centers. Uh, the Center for Public Policy, I mean, for Policy Research on Aging here at UCLA, the Blum Center on Poverty and Health in Latin America, the Latin American Institute, and the International Institute. And we have, most of all, 
to thank Tamar Diana Wilson, um, who has provided support to the center in the past. In many ways, she supported students, uh, research, apprenticeships, but she's not just a donor, she's also a scholar. She's written extensively on the topic of migration, uh, particularly to and from Mexico, uh, and uh, particularly on the experiences of women. So that said, we also have a very special presentation. Oh, okay. People, this is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you want to know who uh, I am. Why am I up a, here? This is Belinda Tucker, the vice provost for the Insti in Institute of American Cultures. Institute of American Cultures, which oversees the four ethnic studies research centers. And we're honored to have her here uh, this morning to present a uh, special announcement. Yes. We have a commendation <laughs> for the Chicano Studies Research Center, which has been run very, very ably for over a decade yes. by John Noriega. Uh, and also this fall being directed by Charlene, Professor Charlene Vila Senor Black. Um, this commendation comes from not just anyone, Hilda Solis, who has done so much for this country. Um, she's now a county supervisor. She was the former Secretary of Labor, the first Latina member of the U.S. Cabinet. Uh, she has served in the California State Assembly. She has served in the Senate. She has served in the U.S. House of Representatives. So this is a commendation that comes from someone um, who has a long commitment of service to the U.S. as a whole. She has given us this lovely commendation to Chicano Studies Research Center on the occasion of this conference in recognition of dedicated service to the affairs of the community and for the civic pride demonstrated by numerous contributions for the benefit of all the citizens of Los Angeles County, signed on September 17th, 2015. So, what an honor. Congratulations. I just thought everybody here knew me, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Belinda, and uh, thanks to um, County Supervisor Hilda Solis. Yes. 